Welcome back to what it's really like to be an entrepreneur. I'm Vincent Lancey, speaker and author of the book Left for Dead, A Story of Redemption. Want to know what it's really like to be an entrepreneur? Well, you came to the right place. Whether you're already an entrepreneur, are looking to start your journey tomorrow, or someone who needs a little extra motivation to get through the day, this is the perfect podcast for you. This is the place where you will learn exactly what it's like in the world of entrepreneurship and hear real life, authentic stories of entrepreneurs grinding on each episode. My goal for this podcast is to help you realize that giving up is never an option. If you missed last week's episode, please be sure to download it after you tune in today. My guest on the show this week is someone that I connected with on LinkedIn. Listeners, please network, network, network. As I was going through my LinkedIn connections list to see who would be a good fit to add value on this episode, Darren quickly came to mind. He's a colleague in the sense of a fellow speaker and philanthropist, but also a founder of one company and a partner of another. He would deliver a ton of value today, and I can't wait for you all to learn his story. Here's my guest, Darren Anderson. Thanks for having me. appreciate it. Absolutely. Darren, why don't you go ahead and share your story and then what you're working on today? Yeah, yeah. So uh, my name is Darren Anderson, originally from uh, Long Island, New York. <clears throat> Went to school at University of Tampa, studied business over there, uh, actually sports management and marketing too. Um, after graduation, had spent uh, probably six years working in corporate America, um, but always had had that entrepreneur mindset. I was kind of the kid growing up that, you know, I had the landscaping business at like 10, you know, I was raking leaves in the fall, shoveling stuff in the winter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and cutting grass in the spring and the summer. So um, it, I always had deep rooted passions of doing my own thing. Uh, but, you know, kind of went the route of working in corporate America with the intentions of, of gaining some experience in how companies work to then put my uh, entrepreneurial mindset to the test of starting my own company. So that was how Stratcore Consultants uh, was born. That is my company. And um, that's, that's what kind of is my, is my nine to five and five to nine, you know, type, uh, type business that I run. We're a business management consulting company, hyper-focused in three areas, talent acquisition, marketing, and business development. So uh, that's, that's great. That's I, can't, show. I can't wait for us to get involved in all of that and dig into all of those you know the difficult times and starting these businesses but yeah same for me i did a little corporate run but then the day i wanted to follow my passion i feel like well, you're young you always hear people saying i wish i did this or the one thing i wish and that's just not something i'm willing to have the degrees don't expire it still shows we worked hard and we have a pretty sophisticated knowledge in that subject area but we want to follow our dreams and i'm pretty confident we'll both do pretty well man so oh, that's the thing I do each week. I share an entrepreneurial story that is sure to inspire our listeners. I enjoy this part of the show because I get to learn a little more about, you know, different celebrities, different figures, different entrepreneurs. Today, we're going to talk about Menage Bargava, another amazing article from Fundable about a true entrepreneur. The article describes him as him going from, and I quote, dreamer to billionaire in a short seven-year period. Listeners, listen, there's certainly no reason that can't be you too. Bhargava was born in India and moved to the U.S. when he was just 14 years old. He dropped out of Princeton after just his freshman year, where next he lived as a monk for 12 years in the mountains of India. He got back in the job field after his return, with jobs ranging from a printing press operator to a taxi cab driver. He began his entrepreneurial path in 1990, creating his first company, a plastics company, that he eventually sold to a private equity firm. But it wasn't until 2004 where he noticed this energy drink at a trade show. He had dreamed of an energy drink with no unknown stimulants, without sugar, and something that also had less fluid ounces than anything else already available on the market. So there you go. He and his planning created a very small 2.49 ounce bottle. You guessed it. This is what was being made into 5-Hour Energy. The, the holding company of 5-Hour Energy is Living Essentials, and they don't publicize their revenue numbers, but the rumor is they do around $300 million <coughs> netting per year. He is now the richest Indian, or as the article says, very close to the Sun Microsystems owner, Vinod Kosla in America. Darren, did you know any of that story? I did not. I did not. That's my goal. That's inspiring, though. I mean, 14 years old, drops out of Princeton, and you never know when you're going to get that idea. He saw an energy drink. It sparked this whole, he percolated all these thoughts to eventually right. roll out the five-hour energy. So yeah. perfect. It's time for the big five each week. My guests and I go over these five questions, Darren, to help 
our listeners learn what it's really like to be an entrepreneur. You ready to rock and roll? Let's do it. Cool. When did you realize that you weren't happy with what you were doing or that you just needed to change? We touched on it briefly before, but let's get into some detail for our listeners. Yeah, yeah. So um, I had spent uh, my time as a labor consultant and talent acquisition specialist in corporate America. I worked a lot in human resources and and kind of just um, decided that, you know, for what I was doing, I was wearing a lot of different hats and I was taking a lot of different criticisms from, you know, people that weren't necessarily putting in the same work that I was. Um, so understanding that the ratio of the work I was putting into the personal satisfaction I was getting was not on par. Um, I was working, you know, anywhere from 40, it was standard, but it, it's never a 40 hour work week when you're a salary position, you know, you take your work home with you and, and the commute, you don't get paid for the commute. Yeah, exactly. And the work life balance just becomes unbearable at times. So um, I set out to do my own thing uh, because I've always had deep rooted passions of doing it, but also, too, for the fact that I wanted more of a work-life balance. I wanted to live life on my own terms. The way I looked at it is, you know, we all only get one life to live. And, Love if it. you know, I'm not living my life to the fullest of my potential or to the fullest of my satisfaction, then, you know, I'm living a subpar life. And that's not what I've ever set out to do. So, you know, that's kind of catapulted me and pushed me into just making sure I got my ducks in a row, but also too, just starting it and uh, hitting the ground running. Well, yeah, you talk about it a lot. Certain things are for some people that aren't for other people. Some people don't mind the extra, the 40 hour work week and the commute each way. They want the 30 year pension and then to retire. Some people, it was the last guest I interviewed was Shane Smith. He talked about the DNA inside entrepreneurs. Inside entrepreneurs, you have that DNA where it's tough to kick and sometimes you gotta let the ball roll. I love that. Yeah. Cool. So what are one or two of the most difficult parts of being an entrepreneur? I would say, um, I mean, first and foremost, this is probably common, but you wear all the hats, you know what I mean? And, and, and when, when you're set out to be an entrepreneur, um, I think a big misconception is that a lot of people think that the second they start their business, they're an entrepreneur. And by definition, that's not right, right? At one point, you're a small business, and then you become an entrepreneur by different investments, different businesses that you may start. Uh, so when you officially become an entrepreneur by the definition sense, you have a plethora of businesses or investments going on, on, a, on constantly, and you're wearing multiple hats in each one of those businesses. So you know you have to be able to adapt, and you have to be able to just kind of cut at, at every single turn in every corner when you need to, you know, if you got to cut right and do something, you got to take care of it and get it done. So there's a lot of hours in the day, uh, to, to that are occupied by work, you know, and as long as you get fulfillment out of doing it, you succeed, but it still doesn't make it any less, you know, easier to get it done. Yeah, there's no boss delegating anything. There's no time management. That's anybody else's right. responsibility but yourself. So that's the first one. Exactly. That. That's number two for our listeners. Number two, I would say um, there, there's a there's a very, uh, I think, dark side of entrepreneurship that a lot of people go through and, and, and individuals that are, um, you know, in business for themselves uh, it's, it's statistical fact. They're more likely to suffer from anxiety and depression and ADHD and, you know, all of these different health concerns that, that kind of pop up just because of the fact that they're so involved in their business. And, um, it's extremely scary. You know, you, you, when good, when times are good, you know, everybody kind of sees when, when, everyone's doing well, right? Social media is a great way for people yeah. to show things they're doing well or make it appear that they're doing well. Um, but what goes on behind the scenes, not many people are are set up to kind of handle. And, and that's, I think, the biggest reason why, you know, more businesses that are started that are small businesses by entrepreneurs, they have a statistical more likelihood of failing in five years than succeeding. Uh, because there's a lot of, 
of, of anxiety and, and stress and pressure that comes along with it. So I would think that's, that's probably the other one that really is an, is an eye opener, I think, for anybody looking to get into the entrepreneur side. I definitely agree. It's a lot of pressure on you. I also agree that every job has their difficult stressors. Everything's difficult, but when the entire company is on your shoulders, every straw, if one falls down, it gets slapped. So I if, yeah, if you think if you think that like if you work for a boss and you're and you're like, man, this guy or this girl really micromanages me. When you micromanage yourself, it's a totally different beast because you know you you just kind of you understand that every single decision you make could have could make or break you, right? It could be an everlasting thing that catapults your business, or it could be something that really kind of lets your competition get ahead of you, you know. So you gotta understand that, you know, it's 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 tough at times. Right. What would you say one of your greatest failures is and what did it teach you? Greatest failure. So it's kind of a, it, it, it's, I got two lessons in, in, in one failure. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. And, uh, and it was a situation where it was on the talent acquisition side of what I do. And uh, I had a candidate that was one of my clients was looking to hire. Um, he had you know, accepted the position put in his two week notice to his company. Um, and it was a substantial amount of money at the time for me when I was just getting started that, uh, you know, I was, I was kind of banking on, um, and banking on it, you know, I didn't really set aside. I said, Oh, well, you know what? The name's on the contract. He signed the contract. We're good to go. Um, so I started banking on that money coming in and you know understanding that i had a safety net set aside for my business thinking that i'm going to have a surplus at this point in time for the foreseeable future yeah. i mean business purchases and some personal purchases that i was you know kind of rewarding myself for for uh, the hard work that i put in and uh at the the literally the 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 12th hour he kind of just reneged on his word and reneged on literally his signed copy. So, you know, it left a sour taste in my client's mouth, obviously my mouth as well, but it also left, you know, a, a, a hole, I guess, in my pocket, right? Because I had count my, I counted my chickens before they hatched, I guess. Um, so it was a, it was a valuable lesson for me to learn um, to have multiple lines in the water and understand that the most unlikely scenario sometimes will surface, you know, and, and be able to handle it. So um, I was, I was fortunate enough to learn it at an earlier stage. So I was able to kind of, you know, adapt and, and learn from it. So the, the, the financial situation wasn't making or breaking my, my business, but you know, anybody that's looking to kind of secure a, a, a larger deal, wait till that funding comes through or that that check comes through and it's clear and it's in there before you start purposing what you're doing with it, you know. Um, Absolutely. I can resonate with that as well. When I was doing some real estate work, I learned and I talked about this on another episode. Buyers are liars. You know, they blow smoke in you. I have this credit score and this much credit history. And you bank on this sale, you're driving the client or his wife or husband around. You don't get paid for anything until the deal closes. I think it's in the bag time and time again. And then, you know, they, I had one example, the potential, well, the client told me he never got evicted twice when he was renting younger and he hasn't paid his taxes in two years. He's telling me he has a 750 credit, the whole nine. So I, I'm with oh, you. Man. I had a lot of chickens before they hatched based on yeah. that check. And I learned a lesson from it. And granted, I was young. So let's move to the next part. Now, if you could choose and have a conversation with any entrepreneur, dead or alive, who would it be? What would you talk about? Why would you pick them? All that. Oh, man. That's a good one. That's, that's There's 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 people. There's, there's got to be a few. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I mean, I'm from New York, obviously. So um, I know you're from New York as well so Gary V is is an amazing uh, marketing minded entrepreneur that I've gotten a tremendous amount of value from Me too. Um, but Me too. I, yeah he'd definitely be at the table um, because I resonate with his message more so from you know the the upbringing and things like that and and you know 
not just what he says now, but but how he got to where he was based off of where you know he lived and things like that. So he's definitely one from a, a personal relation standpoint. Uh, but I, I would say if I had to sit with one person, it probably would be Mark Zuckerberg. Um, one too. I think that uh, yeah. what he's what he's done and and the, the way that he's changed just the way that we interact with, with, you know, one another from, you know, intellectual to intellectual business to business person to um, is, is second to none. And I mean, he's, he is social media, you know what I mean? So, so part of my business. So sit and kind of talk with him uh, about just everything would, would, would be amazing. Absolutely. It's a great, great two answers right there. Let's round about, hear a bunch about your journey now, where you're at. Where do you see yourself in this entrepreneurial endeavor from one year from now and five years from now? Let's first start at one year. Where do you see yourself? Yeah, so um, one year from now, uh, I am hoping to have my, um, my business as an international business. Um, I'm working with, you know, kind of securing some deals, uh, overseas. Uh, so it would be nice to, to, you know, have that accolade and, and be able to kind of, um, service two different, you know, areas. Uh, awesome. so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm super excited about that. I'm super, super stoked. I think in one year we will be an international, you know, company. Um, and, and I also would like to see, uh, more scalability, uh, bringing more individuals on and, and scaling into various areas of, of the country and, and having some um, employees come through and, and a board and, and being able to kind of show them the reins so that I could get to a point where I can delegate. You know, I think I wear so many hats now, having the opportunity to delegate um, and, and trust people that are probably smarter than I am, uh, would be, would be a phenomenal, phenomenal thing for, for me to be able to accomplish in the next year. That'd be great. Yeah, so then five years, you're looking international in one year. How big are we looking at five? Five years from now, uh, I, I want Stratcor Consultants to be a, um, a name brand for talent acquisition. Uh, I want individuals that are looking for better opportunities for themselves and for their family to um, not necessarily feel like they have to go through the process alone. I want them to be able to trust um, that Stratcor has their best interests at heart and and wants nothing but the best for them and their family because you know that's the ultimate um, outside of the money side. The reason why I love the talent acquisition side of what I do, finances are huge for any business, but dealing with the human element is, is just who I am. I'm a socially minded person. So to be able to uh, help our families secure, you know, better opportunities for, for their household is, is something that, you know, I want to be known for. Um, and, and, and if we can help, you know, a million, I think a million families, a million families in, in, in five years uh, is, is definitely the goal. That'd be great. Yeah, as you get older, you start to realize that you are leaving a legacy, whether you want to or not. So how do you want at least a piece of you to be remembered? Thanks so much, Darren, for joining me today. I know our listeners are going to see a ton of value in your episode today. I really like learning about really everything. I liked how you had the courage to leave the corporate job and you did your own thing. And now you're setting goals towards an international level. I think that's every entrepreneur's dream to set your sights as big as possible. And the fact that you're, you're building steps, I think that's a good takeaway from your story. Is that you set attainable goals and you seem to be, you know, not reaching too far. I think it's all remarkable, man. Thanks again for coming on. But it's time for the last word. Is there something that you want to share with our listeners that you didn't get to touch on today? Yeah, uh, I mean, if if I could kind of give a little bit of advice uh, to anybody that's listening to this that either is is going through a tough time in their entrepreneurial journeys or they're looking to, to set out on it, but they're scared. Um, fall forward, understand that you're not alone. There's, you know, you may be alone in your business sense, but there's so many individuals that are like you that have this, like you alluded to earlier, that entrepreneurial DNA um, that, that are rooting for you to succeed and, and um, 
if there's any way that that I can be of you know any sort of help, feel free to reach out to me uh, via LinkedIn, via Instagram, via yeah. Go ahead and share your social media, your website, and all that. That was next anyway. That way they can get in touch with you and follow your journey. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Instagram is at Darren underscore Anderson. Anderson is spelled A N D E R S E N. Um, just so everybody knows, everybody kind of gets it kind of, uh, yeah. mixed up. Um, and, uh, LinkedIn, LinkedIn, come find me, CEO of Stratcore Consultants. You'll see, uh, my face over there and, and, and I'm always on either one of those, uh, website. Um, if you're looking for Stratcore Consultants going through some maintenance right now, we're revamping our whole website. So it, it'll be ready, um, 2020 the start of the start of the year so the next two three weeks or so but that's www.strackworkconsultants.com and if you're looking for help on the social media side of things the other business that i run is our our, uh, media company strat media so that's www.strat s-t-r-a-t-e media.com great guys so be sure to check out those social medias in the meantime for his site his new site to be launched Remember, you can follow our show on Instagram at your favorite morning podcast and on Twitter at Podcast by Lancey. Of course, my handles are at Vincent A. Lancey on all social media and YouTube. And my website is VincentALancey.com. Make sure to grab my book, Left for Dead, A Story of Redemption on Amazon now. DM me or email me. Let me know what you think. If you enjoyed today's episode, please continue listening and rate What's It Really Like to Be an Entrepreneur? Five stars. I work hard to find value delivering stories for you each episode. As always, I will follow the last word with a quote that inspired me, and it will for you too. The glow of one warm thought is to me worth more than money. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you on the next episode of What It's Really Like to Be an Entrepreneur. 